that time of year again. It's Halloween, and we are going to have trick or treat going on at our church this year. And it's going to be on October 31st. The actual trunk or treat will be from 1 to 3, but we, if you would like to participate, you need to have your car at the church by noon. Decorate your car any way you'd like, and we're going to, this is how I want you to do your candy. I want you to take baggies, put your candy, wearing gloves, put your candy in the bags, two or three pieces, zip it up, and we'll set them out on the table. With the card table in front of your car, you should have six feet of distancing for social distancing. Also, on the day, the kids will wear gloves, we'll hand them out, and we'd like for you to all to please wear your masks to protect yourself and to protect others. If you have any questions, please give me a call. And if you're interested in having your, bringing your car and decorating it to help us celebrate, I also need to know that so we have an idea of how many cars will be coming. I can't wait to see you. Can't wait to see your costumes. And happy Halloween!
let us join together in prayer. O God, who leads his people from places of bondage to places of promise, and who wrestles with us in every wilderness for our own good, lead us and be with us here. When I was hungry, you gave me food. When I was thirsty, you gave me drink. When I was a stranger, you welcomed me. When I was naked, you clothed me. When I was sick, you took care of me. When I was a prisoner, you visited me. You lead us from oppression to freedom. You deliver us from trauma to triumph, to a place of trust where we may join with you and each other in healthy relationships in the beloved community. In the meantime, you provide us and provoke us. You call us to responsibility, to create true community, true to you, true to each other, and true to the whole creation. Praise be to you. Amen. Let us all pause and listen for the voice of the still speaking God as we observe a period of silence. Righteous indignation is everywhere these days. Too many convinced they are right as and everyone else is wrong. We call on God's name as though that might settle the matter. How can so many different points of view be ascribed to one God? How do we know which one is right? In Psalm 40, we read, Happy are those who make the Lord their trust, who do not turn to the proud, to those who go astray after false gods. Let us now turn to God, not this God or that God, but to the true and living God, whose love is always directed toward our neighbor and our enemies. To our love, should, there should be directed to. It is there where Jesus was headed on his own journey. Let us all pray. Something in my life feels broken, and yet I pretend to be whole. If I banish it to the realm of the unspoken, it continues to take its toll. There's something in me that wants to pretend and pretending seeks to defend. But what, O oh God, and why? I cling to a notion of me. Not doing so much makes me afraid. I cling to a notion of me, one that causes me and others pain. I cling to a notion of me against him and her and them. I give to you, O oh God, this me. Forgive me, make me whole again. Let me be like you above, like your unfailing love. Hear the good news. God is love. To trust in God is to say yes, yes to our being transformed. Love is reaching out and beyond. To love in short, is to live. In God's love, we are born again, and again, and again. Praise be to the living God. Praise be to God of all life. Jesus said, Love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and love your neighbors as yourself. Let us do so now. At this time, we would welcome you to give your offerings and gifts to support the ministries of the church. 
For contributions to the church, go to our webpage, www.embracethequestions.com, and under Giving, click the Online button. There you can set up reoccurring donations or a one-time gift. If you prefer to give by mail, you can send a check to First Congregational Church, 1701 Southwest Collins Avenue, Topeka, Kansas, 66604. Or, as always, you can contact the church and we will arrange a contact-free pickup. The special offering for the month of October is Neighbors in Need. Thank you. Please join me in saying the prayer of thanksgiving. You show me, Lord, my neighbor's need. You show me, too, my own. You show me that they both agree, for no one lives alone. To you I offer thanks and praise. The whole of creation lives in you. May I be found there, too? You, O God, create and amaze. For this we offer thanks and praise. Amen. Please join me in saying the covenant of the First Congregational Church. In the love of truth and the spirit of Jesus, we unite for the worship of God and the service of humankind. We stand for the freedom of the individual in matters of belief, the importance of education, and the prime place of worship in attaining harmony with God. We would practice the rule of love by tolerance of the opinion of others, service to those in need, and kindliness to everyone. We agree to support the church in every way possible. Amen. Show.
reading from the 22nd chapter of the Gospel of Matthew. Give therefore to the emperor the things that are the emperor's, and to God the things that are God's. With these words, Jesus dodged a bullet. The Pharisees meant to entrap him. No matter how he answered their question, he would be suspect either to empire or to the religious community. Jesus avoided the trap. His answer turned matters back on those who raised the question. They will have to sort out matters. What is it that really belongs to God? What is it that really belongs to the emperor? And Jesus' answer lies in our lap as well. How shall we answer the question of empire and church? Jesus treated his questioners and Jesus treated us as adult members of the faith community. He gives no simple answers. We are adults after all. We are left to work it out for ourselves. Jesus trusts us to do this. Our lesson from Matthew comes just in time to think about the relationship between the state and the church, between politics and religion, as we come near to a national election. Our passage from Isaiah suggests that God is in control of our lives as well as our destinies. In Isaiah, the Lord of heaven and earth has called a Persian, a Persian ruler, Cyrus by name, to be the instrument of deliverance of the Lord's people from exile. God is sovereign over nations. God can raise up people who work for peace and justice in the world just when all seems lost. We've seen it in our own time. They don't have to be Christian to be God's instruments. The Dalai Lama, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Mahatma Gandhi, John Lewis, all were God's instruments. Who would have believed it possible? Such leaders inspire in us hope for the world's future. God has not given up on this world. It is God's world after all. It is not the devil's world. It is not the emperor's world. God is sovereign, though that sovereignty is often hidden from our eyes. Two passages that inevitably come to mind when we think about the relation of empire and church are the passages from Romans 13, and from Revelation 13. Romans 13 is supportive of empire. And we read, let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. And those authorities that exist have been existed by God. That's from Romans 13, verse one. Church and empire live in their respective spheres. Paul was a Roman citizen who benefited much from the Roman order of the empire in his missionary work. He sees empire as friend. Empire preserves the basic orders of life. It is not so with John of Patmos, the author of the book of Revelation. For him, engine, empire is beast. Empire is evil and oppressive. Empire deals in death. God must bring empire to ruin or there is no hope for the oppressed people of God. Two biblical passages, two different contexts, two different views of the role of the empire. Martin Luther's experience of empire was both good and bad. Charles V wanted him to put away, put away for his views. His prince, John, protected him. For John Calvin, Christ is transformer of culture. The Anabaptists were outlaws to the state. 
Christ is against the culture. The heirs of this tradition have begun to sing a new song about empire in contemporary America. Throughout most of its time in the church, the church in the West has been in serious dialogue with the empire about the shape of the empire's rule. The church, that is, has been a partner with the empire in creating society. Most of our thinking about the empire has been thinking that has taken place with the empire, even at the very heart of the empire, at the very center. This is certainly a grand departure from the world of Jesus. It is clear that Jesus came to do ministry among the poor, the oppressed, the victims, the outcasts. Jesus' ministry served those on the edge of empire. The Western Church has done its thinking about church and empire from the edge. We have mostly done our thinking from the center, and the church faces a dilemma here. The Reformed theologian Douglas John Hall asserts that in North America today, the church has been pushed to the very margins of power. Hall claims that today the church again lives on the edge of the empire. What we might say about the empire from the edge will be quite different from what we said about empire from the center. We have been pushed to the very edge. That's just where Jesus did his ministry, on the edge. Our thinking about church and empire might undergone radical change as we find ourselves on the margins of empire in the company of all the marginalized. Who among the candidates, which of the political parties has a word to say to us on the very edge of the empire? Jesus trusts us as adult Christians to wrestle with these new realities of empire and church. Our text from Matthew clearly states that loyalty to faith and or Caesar was a dilemma in the very first century. Nothing plagues Christians more consistently, nor raises such fierce battles among us as the question of the Christian's loyalty to the state. Does being a good Christian go hand in hand with being a good citizen? Do love of God and the love of country belong together? Is patriotism consistent with the gospel of Jesus Christ? All of these questions are symbolically represented under the one question, does the flag, does the American flag belong in church? The expectation that this one brief passage from Matthew regarding paying taxes to the emperor, emperor will answer all these questions, that would be unrealistic. Christian understanding of faith in God and loyalty to country requires a deeper look at many passages from the Bible. Nevertheless, this passage helps us reflect on the Christian understanding of patriotism. In this passage, Jesus clearly averts the question through which the Pharisees and Sadducees had hoped to entrap him. Is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not? While stylistically Jesus' answer, render unto the emperor what is the emperor, and render unto God what is God's, appears to be a parallel structure. Theologically, the second half of the sentence carries far greater weight, for everything, of course, is owed to God. No notice of an earthly kingdom and a heavenly kingdom, which demand equal loyalty, presents itself here. While some Christian theologians and ethicists rule patriotism 
altogether out of bounds for Christians. Others believe that many concerns of the state and of Christians coincide. The Matthean text seems to indicate that Christians have some loyalty to the state. What does the loyalty look like? What is an appropriate Christian patriotism? When the crisis which led to the Gulf War first broke out, patriotism in the United States soared. Tremendous increase occurred in the number of men and women volunteering for military service. The demand for American flags increased so fast that production could hardly match it. What was disturbing about this upsurge in American patriotism is the seemingly necessary link between patriotism and war. Why, I wonder, does it take the threat of war to increase our patriotic spirit? Why can't we become patriotic over educating our children or feeding the hungry? Why wouldn't patriotism soar over the possibility of being able to brag to the world, every child in America has access to a good education? Why wouldn't our loyalty to the United States, United States urge us to boast, in America we respect our elderly and protect them and take good care of them? Or, in the United States, we make sure that everyone has access to good mental health facilities or good jobs or excellent health care. These issues, however, do not tend to engender patriotism. Only the threat of war, along with the possibility of destroying human lives, create great loyalty to our country. However noble patriotism can be, Christians must admit First of all, that it can be an ally of sin. Aldous Huxley noted that, quote, one of the great attractions of patriotism is that it fulfills our worst wishes. In the person of our nation, we are able vicariously to bully and cheat, bully and cheat. What's more, with a feeling that we are profoundly virtuous." End of quote. The passage from Matthew suggests that this cannot be the case for Christians. If patriotism is not totally ruled out of bounds for Christians, Matthew clearly claims that the nature of patriotism must be transformed by our loyalty to Christ. Expressions of patriotism during times of peace, as well as during times when men and women are called to risk their lives and to risk taking the lives of other people in war, should always prompt the church to ask, is this patriotism consistent with our loyalty to Christ? During times of war, Christians must ask, for what purpose does our country require its military men and women to risk human lives? Are they being asked to risk lives for the sake of economic gain? Or are they being asked for the sake of protecting a certain way of life? Can Christians honestly say that this potential sacrifice is consistent with Christ's suffering on the cross and with the sacrifice Christ bids us to make for the sake of others during peacetime as well as during wartime. Patriotism stands in potentially serious conflict with the love of God in the exclusivity it promotes regarding our concern for other people. Christians believe that God's love is universal. God is as concerned for the farmer struggling to make a living as far away as Mexico as for the struggling farmer in Kansas or California. Whereas patriotism 
tends to promote concern for Americans alone, agape requires, requires us to love neighbors as ourselves. Neighbor for Christians can never be defined along nationalist lines. Worldwide communion, which we celebrate every year on the first Sunday of October, is in fact a reality at every, every communion. The table, the communion table, is never defined as American or Korean or African or Japanese. At every Lord's Supper cel celebration, we go to the table with Christians all around the world. A hymn listed in many hymnals under citizenship reflects the kind of love of country, which is not exclusive, but, re but recognize the value of other peoples and places and is therefore consistent with the love of God. And I quote from that hymn, This is my song, O God of all the nations, a song of peace for lands afar and mine. This is my home, the country where my heart is. Here are my hopes, my dreams, my holy shrine. But other hearts in other lands are beating with hopes and dreams as true and high as mine. Let us pray. God of heaven and earth, wind and fire, you are as close to us as the air we breathe, yet you also dwell in thick darkness. You love us yet. In love you refuse to move at our call. We know your name, but we do not always understand your ways. Show us, we pray, as much of you as we can bear to see. Come close to us, but continue to resist being used by us. Stand against us when our wills are not your will. Love us in ways that do not abandon us to our own devices. Amen.
Let us affirm our faith. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope. In life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us pray as our Savior taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now, Lord, make me an instrument of thy peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light and where there is sadness, joy. O Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love, for it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. <laughs> 